All right. Ooh, that was loud. I think we're getting ready to go here. What do you think, Mr. Height? You ready for action? Larry Height is always ready for action. That's one thing I've learned about him. So how did I meet Larry? I met Larry Height through his daughter, Robin, who I met at an Aspen Institute event. One of the best things about living in Aspen is the people you get to meet. And uh, where else in the world would a guy like me be palling around with a guy like Larry Height on a day-to-day -day basis? I'd have zero access to someone like him in New York City. So one of the amazing reasons to be in Aspen. And this is the Aspen Character Series, and this is one of the better characters I've met up here in all my years. So um, Larry always has shown a big curiosity for life and he always takes a genuine interest in people and I've had a lot of fun hanging out with him and getting to know him a little bit. And some of the interesting things about Larry and um, his book, so this is his book, The Rule, How I Beat the Odds in the Markets and in Life and How You Can Too. And for me, this book has been really enlightening. Um, Larry goes into his disabilities as a child and the things that he had to overcome to become one of the most successful hedge fund managers of all times. And uh, he's world renowned for what he does. And he credits his disabilities as some of the reasons why he was able to become so successful. So Larry was born uh, blind in one eye, half blind in the other, and not the most coordinated person in the world. Would that be fair? Yeah. I'm not really sure about the world, but close to it. <laughs> okay. All right. So, and also dyslexic. So for him to become such one of the best numbers guys of all times is pretty extraordinary. And uh, as Larry told me, he was often one of the last people chosen to be on any, any team sport as a child. So it's about overcoming limitations, not only overcoming them, but using them to propel you to your, uh, find your talents in life. And like Larry says, winners never quit. So when I heard that Larry wrote this book, I was one of the first people to buy a bunch of them on Amazon. I pre-ordered them last year. I was excited when it showed up and I thought I was gonna be getting stock tips and learning all these uh, trading secrets. But really what it is is uh, strategies for life and ways that Larry can help you be successful by applying the strategies that helped him be successful and they cross over into anything you might do with your life, I believe. So. I felt a little bad for Larry when I found out that he had this great book out. I read the book, I loved it, and his whole signing tour had been canceled because of the COVID. So decided, hey, why don't we have a little book signing tour here in Aspen? Larry even had a whole trip planned to China to do a China signing tour because apparently Larry Height is a bigger deal in China than David Hasselhoff is in Germany. <laughs> That's the word on the streets. So, um, happy to have Larry and Sharon Height here. And uh, Larry's going to drop some knowledge bombs on us today, so I'm going to get out of the way. And thank you so much, Larry. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much for having me. You know, since I'm here, I might, I'm going to tell you why I'm here. Um, as he said, I was born in Brooklyn. Now, some people confuse Brooklyn and Aspen. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to make it clear. Brooklyn doesn't have any mountains. There was a hill in Prospect Park that are all less enlightened children like me called Suicide Hill. And you took your sled up the hill, and as you saw the bus coming, you went down the hill, through the bus, if you were lucky, and, uh, and that's, so nobody in Brooklyn is that small. No, I got hands. I'm going to tell you guys uh, how I turned five hundred thousand dollars into twelve million dollars in cash. Now the only people in Brooklyn 
whoever saw twelve million dollars. Were the mafia, assortment of drug dealers. That's, that's it. <laughs> well, you noticed no doctors ever have twelve million. I had twelve million dollars in cash. Right? Um, and I'm going to tell you how I lost, how I and other people lose money. Let me see. And how you can be sure you lose money. First, oh, I forgot, I finally got a Marty. All right, Marty was this guy in Brooklyn. He lived, he's 60 years old. He lived, been there all his life. And he heard that his friend Eric, just won the lottery and made ten million dollars. Oh, he was so fucking peeled. He ran out of his house, right? I barely dressed, goes out, says, God, I want to talk to you. He runs to the beat. God, I want to talk to you now. Well, it was a beautiful day like this, and it turned black jet black, and right in front of him, a lightning bolt came crashing down right between his legs, but missing the important part. And he says to God, look, there's been for 50 years, for 50 years there's been a lottery. That jerky friend of mine just won a million dollars. Look, God, I go to temple. I go to church. I go to the Holy Rose. I even went to the Black Panthers. Fifty years, I have not won once. All of a sudden, another lightning bolt comes down. And God said, did you ever buy a ticket? <laughs> and basically, that's the first thing about winning. If you don't buy a ticket, it is impossible to win. I, my mother would have called me a financier. My father had more direct ways. We gambled some shit. Um, but I've always been interested in winners and losers, and why people win and lose. And I found a lot of people don't win because they don't play. Just, it, it, it's that simple. You, you probably met a hundred people in your life, you know, people that old. Um, where they say something like, I had this great idea. I always have great ideas. And you ask, and then you come, well, like what? He says, well, I never can raise the money to do the ideas. But I know they would have been great. And that's why, it, so it's a simple mathematical game. If you have a 1% chance of winning a million dollars, right? You have an infinite better chance of winning that if you buy the ticket. Because zero is zero. And you don't go anywhere without a goal, right? I mean, I mean, think about it. Let's say you want to. Let's say you want to go to Minnesota for whatever reason. I don't. I haven't figured out why. But um, and you just sort of you won't get to Minnesota. You might well get to the end of the wall over there and come back. In order to go somewhere. You gotta name it to claim it. 
And people, believe it or not, don't do anything to, to actually take action. And I, I, I was, I was very surprised at that. Because let's say you're born like me. You can't see. Uh, you trip over yourself. I was in a friend of mine in England, uh, Lord Stanley, who came from a very poor family in Manchester. I'm getting out of his limousine. I trip, which was, and I ran on my, and I, and I actually do tunnel saw and stand up. Stanley being very polite Englishman, he said, were you trained as an acrobat? <laughs> I said, no, I fell a lot. And that was a great lesson. See, when you fail a lot, this, the next part of failing is getting up. And getting up is the second thing you have to do after you fall. Because it becomes cold in the winter and about any homeless person could tell you. And getting up is very important because it's like you can't be in a boxing ring and be surprised that the guy in the other guy is trying to punch in your teeth. You made a mistake. You're in the wrong place. And getting up is all about how you win. Because you are gonna be here. The, 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 the other guy there wants to, that's, he came there to leave you toothless. But I, I think all the handicaps I had actually taught me how to get up. And so that helped. Now I'm going to tell you, one day I saw, I wish I had a blackboard, I saw the price of coffee going like this. The supply of coffee going like that. The price of the raw co coffee was going down below the price that it cost to make the coffee, you know? So I said, well, that can't happen. I mean, you can't, I mean, it just didn't make any sense to me. So I took a million dollars and I divided it into four pots. Pot. Because, see, nobody but a liar and even a very dumb liar will tell you exactly. You don't see the television, how somebody on NBC or tells you where the price is going to be. Really, I have bought highs, bought lows, okay? I've done this for 50 years. And I will tell you, every time I sold the top or bought the bottom. It was pure luck. Anybody tells you any different is either on some very good drugs <laughs> or is lying. Uh, that's why I I'm talk about lying. Uh, well, I just said, but no. I use numbers, and I use numbers for a very interesting. If you use a word like blue, well, 
right? Does it mean that blue, the blue of the street, a uh, harbor? It, it has no, you don't know what it is. It, 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 it happened, it's a fact, but you wouldn't be very precise. You, you have to see it and examine it. And so, I, this, this happened with two guys. One, one guy was running the company, he was an MIT graduate, and this second guy was also an MIT graduate. And, and they were technical analysts. I'm a kid, I'm working there. I'm maybe, I'm working there five months. But I was pretty good at what they call the charters. So it's about nine o'clock at night. They call me in to the head guy's office. There's papers spewing out on the floor. And they're deciding if it's a head and shoulders or what the other guy called an upshot. I sat there. These guys went to MIT. Next job, I can see for them is the government. Because if they don't even know what's on the paper, if you have to have a third guy to come in, to tell them, I said, this, this is, this is, this, this is nothing. So I decided that I was going to be, I use numbers. Because if I tell you the six bottles of Schlitz in the ice box, you know exactly, there's no debate. You don't, you, don't, you don't call over this guy and say, is there six bottles? You open, you open the door, and there are five because somebody stole one, but you know exactly what you're dealing with. Now, before I tell you how I made that money, I'm going to... Um, I'm going to tell you how to lose money. These are tried and true methods. First of all, first of all, think that the markets owe you money. There was a guy came, I was working in his brokerage office, and every day he came down at some time, must have been his lunch time, and he wanted to know the price of sugar. Because one day, five years before that, he had made a lot of sugar, he had made a lot of money, made a million dollars in sugar. And then he lost a million plus another million. He decided in his wisdom that the market owed him two million dollars. The market never said anything to him, but he decided. So he came down, he said, I, I said, well, why don't you trade coffee, corn, uh, gold? He said, no, I'm getting it back from sugar. This went on for a year. He was out one day. He had a cold. The sugar took off to an all-time high. I said, um, um, I looked at him. I said, you must be very happy. He said, no. But the sugar's gone up. I missed it. I said, well, why don't you go back in now? You know, it's going up, right? I mean, if you missed the first day, 
there's going to be a second, third, and fourth day, theological. We said, no, I missed it. I'm going to wait for the next big movie. I don't know when he died, uh, but it was certainly, he had no cavities because he never saw sugar again. <laughs> and people get, that's one of the things, people have ideas that once they get in there, they're baked in. Now I come from middle class family, maybe a lower class, and and I've done better than anybody in my family. So my mother's coming up to visit me. I lived in a big house and, and had a lot of connecting rooms. And my mother says to me, Larry, we're all proud of your success. Why don't you quit on the idea of your head quit? That was my mother, right? Four months later, my nine-year-old daughter walks in. I'm sitting at the same desk. She doesn't even particularly like my mother, right? She says to me, Dad, you've done well. Why don't you quit? Well, I, I said, this is the only thing A, I have ever done well. Sports, school, well, I've done very well. I, I, if you look at that lady in romance, I've done, the only thing that actually worked out. <laughs> but there's all, all the rest were, um, and so, uh, and, but I was amazed. Nine years old, 69 years old, the same thing. And they're, they're telling me I should quit. I, the only thing I've ever done. I, and, People get ideas. Something is labeled risky. And I'll tell you how I, I told you about the coffee, and I laid out that I put a million dollars, but I knew I didn't know the bottom, and I knew I didn't know top. So I lost the first time, the second, and I was bicycling with my wife in the Loire Valley in France, and she and we were bicycling 30 miles a day. So you want to go to the top and get the soreness. Oh, uh, when, when I met this guy, these guys, they were all Australian. And I've spent the time in Australia. Um, I said to my wife, you're going to have a great time. Now there's an Australian. So we went and drank lunch, which was more than many times. <laughs> you see, every time they went into a room. See, they weren't like Brooklyn Jewish people, every time they go into a room, they eat. These people always drank. But it was, and so I'm in the bathtub, and my wife walks in and hands me the phone and says it's your broker in London. Hand up, I don't want to touch it. You sit in the bathtub and touch it. I'm not touching it. He said, Co guy calls up, he said, Larry, you're ahead six million dollars. What, what do you want to do? How much you want to do? I said, buy more. And then my friends started to call me. 
And people who actually were my friends. And one guy says, Larry. I looked, everybody in the broker's firm was looking at my position. Um, you're up $8 million. I think I'd buy some more. Then somebody calls me up at 10. And these were friends of mine. They were not my enemies. Finally, I get to $15 million. And I see it starts to go down. So I sell. And I net out 12. So that's $500,000 and $12 million. I'm pretty happy. But I had never seen $12 million in my life. The only people that had that kind of cash that I knew from Brooklyn were drug dealers, mafia people, and people of that ilk. But nobody had $12 million. And I, I, now what do you think? What was going through my head? Do you think it was joy, uh, fear of losing? What does anybody want to guess? Fear, I would say. What? Fear. Yes. You are totally correct. Not of losing money, because money's shit I trade all the time. But all of a sudden, I had a girlfriend. Her father wanted to see her out of the house. And all of a sudden, people would start asking for, for stuff. So I, my fear was, I was just, I didn't know what to do. And because I had not thought this out, I never thought I'd see $12 million, ever. So I made no plan for winning, nothing. And if you want to win, there's several questions. You ask yourself, one is, who are you? Then you ask yourself, where are you? Um, for instance, if you had $100 million and cast in your bonds in New York City, how much money do you think of that $100 million you just sold your company for? How much do you think you get after taxes? You're pretty close, about 60, 40%. Oh, you've been there. No, <laughs> capital gains taxes. So, they don't think of when you make a plan, you should think we're brought up to be risk averse. Just think of it. What do you got to do in life? You got to keep breathing and you got to eat something in the shelter. Maybe a big rock. I mean, we've been doing this for thousands of years since we were monkeys. And you don't work out exactly, nobody, and you dealt with stuff that you never dealt with. And I should have done, gone short, but I had never seen $12 million. I literally did not know how to handle it. And I was unprepared for winning. So what I'm saying to you, my book, my book is very, oh, why did I write? I had two girls. And um, I wanted to leave them something that'll tell them how 
mostly blind, crippled kid. Um, could, could have done that. Because I believe everybody in this room could do it. But people, especially young girls, have a negative feeling about themselves. Because when they look in a magazine, they see a shot of other young girls who look fabulous. And the young, and they don't know that that picture is a result of 12 or 20 trial pictures. And they picked, they took the picture that was the best. So they feel inferior to the girl in the picture because they don't have any idea how that picture was made. It's very, there's a, there's a don't, um, David Ricardo um, was, lived in Spain until the um, Spanish threw all the Jews out. So he went, he went to London. And right near the London, London Exchange was an alleyway. It was cute. It was called Jew Alley. And they ran an exchange in the street with the term curb stuff, sitting on the curb. And he went there to trade. Now, he's a very famous economist. And he wrote about land rent and all kinds of things. But he became, he, he married a Quaker girl, uh, a very religious Jewish family, and they, dis, they disowned him. He married out of religion. He said, I don't care, I'm marrying her. And he became the richest man in England in English. And so I'm reading all these papers about soil and trade and I'm just trying to find a way to make money. Because the first thing my father said to me in the crib, or well, very shortly after, your job, Larry, is to support me for the rest of my life. And Uncle Larry, it is because immigrants, parents, say this. But I saw my uncles and aunts and my family support their mothers. It, it, it was that simple. That was my job. The fact that I didn't see, walk, um, I, I won an award because the charity work I, I do. Uh, I saved people. Well, I, I met some people and I joined them who were saving people from the scholars, um, um, fleeing. See, dictators don't like scholars if they don't join up. So, um, 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 Henry Jarecki became a billionaire. And um, one other guy famous in, uh, in Sukhmokit started this program to save people. And it meant you had to take the family out of like Russia. Because if you leave someone there, they'll be dead. And so I met this guy, Tom Russo, and he, he and I worked on the first futures fund. And we developed how things should be paid. He comes up to me, I thought by now he'd be the head guy I had to look for. Him. He said, no, no, Larry, you gotta, you gotta hear what I'm saying. So I said, oh, okay. He's telling me about people's 
saving people's lives. Now, I look at the world as a bet. And I say, I could save someone's life. Me, Larry Hyde. You know, dumb kid from Brooklyn who can't see. In fact, when, when, when this got out, uh, and we were going to get, there was a guy, Arnie, and he said, Larry Hyde, he used to walk into walls. Which he was right. Uh, but that's part of not seeing. So I, I said to myself, this is a great asymmetrical bet. Here I could save some lives, and, and what's the risk to me? And then I figured out a way to make, actually it's some girl, but I paid for it, how to put the whole thing on a recording so when people went and asked for money, they all saw the same thing with the same pictures. And it raised like a million dollars. And I thought that was a great asymmetrical play. And we say, I show you what was really cool. There was a guy in southern, southern Russia. And he was, for some reason, an expert. He was a doctor. And he was an expert on Mediterranean diseases. We got him out, put him in southern Italy, and over the next decade, he saved a thousand people. And I thought that was like a great bet. And, uh, and my, 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 wife, my wife does most of the entertainment stuff and operas and make sure they happen. But the foundation allowed me to a bigger world and yet to help her. She comes, I've been so lucky uh, with women, which, First of all, mostly every woman that I ever got involved seriously had a GPS about twice as mine. I mean, she really smart. Her brother, her brother and her son are genius category. And she's really, you can see, really great looking. Um, and so he, what he did was Corvus, he went to MIT, where he graduated, found somebody with a copying machine that makes a thing. You know, it, you put it in and you can make a chair. We made 2,000 masks, specially designed at MIT for nurses. We gave them to a hospital, a chain of hospitals, for free. Now, if you multiply how many people the nurses save, it's fabulous, asymmetrical bet. I thank you. I, oh, I'd like to ask a question. I'd like to hear you guys think, let's say you buy all those books, I'll give it back to him, and he'll keep the money. I want to hear you. The great thing about the Institute, although they have a lot of smart speakers, is the audience. Because there's at least three, every class I've ever been to, there's at least three people who know as much as the guy is speaking. I mean, it, it's, a, it's a fabulous place. So if you guys um, 
want to spend the next 10 minutes talking or, or each person stands up and says, what local charity you like and whatever you collected, he's going to send it to that charity. And I want to just sit here and listen. Thank you for your time. Should I go first? Sure. Okay. Well, I'm just going to get people in here. All right. So, I don't know, maybe I'll we'll use the mic if we want, but for me, I usually give to the Aspen Animal Shelter because they're the first, uh, I think they're the first no-kill shelter. He's like got the model of that and uh, just really respect what they do. So usually give to them, but I would say also Challenge Aspen would be a contender. I've worked with all the disabled athletes in the Valley, a lot of vets who come home with uh, missing limbs and such, and a lot of blind in here, and a lot of blind skiers. And they have basically a World Cup tour, just like able-bodied skiers, and that's based here in Aspen too. So there's a couple good charities there that I'd like to throw out there. And who's next? I don't know if we need a microphone or not. Well, you know what I would say, the animal shelter. Ah, animal shelter. <laughs> got another one for the animal shelter. Also, just to be fair, it's his, his oldest friend in town. Yeah, that's true. My, my friend <laughs> Seth Saxon, yeah. We have a mutual yeah. friend who started that and uh, serves the community well. Yep. Anyone else here have anything there? Yeah, Miss Natalie. strong that's a, that's good and that's a good point too for some reason Larry this valley and the ski towns in Colorado have one of the highest suicide rates which is something you would think to be counterintuitive given the quality of life that we have here but we can't quite figure that out whether it's you know that's that's one of those things that's kind of a tough downside to our community that we try to work through so that's a very very good suggestion Aspen strong does anyone else have any Anything locally? Sunny? Um, well, I, I'd like to support, support Anderson Ranch and a lot of the art organizations here. I think they do a lot for the community and they changed my life. I started taking some art classes many, many years ago. And, um, yeah, Anderson Ranch is another great thing we have access to here to get like world class art teachers and people come here. And that's supported by charity as well, right? Donations and such. Okay. Nonprofit. Nonprofit. Good one. Does anyone else have anything? Okay, well, we'll pick one of those four then. Um, yeah. What do we do? Vote on it? Or? Well, you know, yeah. And, uh, okay. So let's vote. <laughs> <laughs> All right. By mail. <laughs> Secret ballot? Yeah. Um, okay, so. Yeah, how do we do this? Just pick All right. Josh. Aspen. It's a dictatorship. You might as well. Right. I'm picking Aspen Strong just because that's something I haven't given to before. I lost a good friend in the last year here, so I think that's something we should work through as a community and something different. So if anyone buys any books here to be signed by Larry Height, that's what we're going to give to charity. And then we also have pizza, and we have a cash bar, and we got you know all the iced tea and coffee and whatever you want. We're going to open the doors and hang out by the pool, too. We're going to get the party started. I want to thank Josh. Uh, yeah, thanks. Yeah. Thank you all. Thanks for coming, and thank you, Larry, and thank you, Sharon. And uh, that's it. Let's, uh, Great. Great. And happy Labor Day weekend, everybody. Yeah. I try to avoid Do we want Q&A?
You, you mentioned that you were afraid when you put the, the money in with the coffee, but but you really you weren't afraid because you had to be prepared to lose the money to bet. That is the smartest question. You can't when you bet. You gotta ask yourself, what's the odds of winning, and how much are you prepared to lose? to get that amount of money. And if you don't do that, you're completely off center because you have no reference point. So, so you decided you'd, you'd bet a million. You, you were prepared to lose the million. Well, every time I make a bet, I have a stop. And if you're not prepared to lose, I um, once uh, we were on the board of uh, Metropolitan, my wife's son, not me, uh, orchestra. And we're in this guy's house, and I see a book, and it's about him. He's like one of the top venture capitalists in the world, right? Um, so, I said, can I borrow this? He said, but you really got to give it back. So he said, look, if you're going to do venture capital, be prepared to lose three times what you bet. And if you're not prepared to lose three times, then the reward's not good enough. And you, I'm, I'm a great, great, maybe too far, but I'm at least proficient because of all my problems. I'm willing to deal with the problem before it comes. And that, that's why I was able to, that's why I win. What David Ricardo said um, was cut your losses fast and hold on to your winnings. What Larry Height says, cut your losses fast but add to your winnings. Would anybody want to know how to make money in the stock market? Sure. The only one? Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. This this now I can guarantee you I'll tell these people and maybe one of you will do this for a year. But if you look at the stocks on the New York, American, the big stocks, big they need the big stocks because that's where the big money is. And you can get that in and out. Right? Because, like, nobody in their right mind would put their money in China now. Because you might win, but you never get to see that money or the other money win. So, go in and look at the biggest winners, all new highs, right? New highs. You've never seen people go short and become very rich. People become rich by winners and stay with them till they lose. That's it. Now I do my, my wife who tell who will testify that I'm the laziest person she she could ever know. <laughs> um, because I work for my bed. I get up, that's how I get up, I get cold, I buy this, buy that, blah, and I, oh, and in order to do this correctly, I have computers that do the work for me. 
I wrote the formulas, but I'm looking. First of all, given my track record at school, sports, I had the pen and the book on ID. <laughs> so, what I do is, I made a machine. I invented my own casino. And, and the great thing about what I do, about the market, it's not what I do, the market doesn't care if you're Jewish, Greek, black, white, Indian, or anything. They just plan that you put the money in. And you can win whatever you want. It's yours. Right? They, 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 they don't care. And so it, it's a great way to accumulate money. It's not so good tax-wise, but it, it's, it, 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 it's, um, it's like American Rodeo. The great thing about American Rodeo is if you put up your money, you get your shot or broken bone. But it's open to everybody. So if you take the top five winners for the year that are in new high ground, buy them, buy them, hold them for a year. You make money. Set a, set a, a losing bottom. I had a friend of mine. Texas came out here to visit me a couple of weeks ago. And he's, a, he's one of the guys who, who left Wharton in his last quarter. Uh, he, was a, he was on a football team on a scholarship. And he saw what the clouds was going to be. So he started with $15,000. His mother, father, and him. His father was a professional football player and a lawyer. So they're smart and kind of tough people. And he bought the top of the list. And I, I've been, we've been friends for a decade. Yeah, almost about, about the same time we were married. Uh, and he set it up so if it went down 5%, it was gone. But if it goes back to a new high, it was going to go. And he had, and that's it. In the computer, his, his fantasy million dollars turned into $20 million over a year. Now, as a kid, as a broke guy, I wasn't such a great salesman, but I used to live off that list. Not on what I sell. I would just, but be, be, look, I mean, simple, really simple mind. When you go short, even if you go all the way, you can't go further. But an Amazon can grow to the moon. So if you stay with the winners and buy the winners, you'll have winners. You know, I had been, I, I had a I had a list which I didn't get to of how to lose. And it, it, one way to lose is hang around with losers. <laughs> right? The more people who fail that are in your social circle, you'll be accepted and you will join them. Now, your wife might not be your wife if you made a small fortune out of a large one. <laughs> but staying with those winners, it, it, it is amazing to me. 
somebody, and this happens only in the stock market. It happens in no other part of life. Um, people, oh, oh, how did my friend do? He lost 85 times out of his 100. The 15 he has, he's now worth $20 million. So it's very simple. Set your loss, and it can be the whole thing, but actually set the bet. Like buy options, buy, because you can go down a lot. The, the other thing is, you gotta know who you are. I was too inexperienced to have $12 million. I was not prepared to have all that focus because I literally did not know what I wanted. Uh, my girlfriend, father thought it would be a wonderful thing if we got married as fast as possible before I could lose it. I think he wanted to lose it for me. Um, watch your leverage, keep your discipline, and you'll win. And, and in my, I'll end, never let your failure and what you think about your failures get to be bigger than your dreams. Because they're both illusions. But if you walk around with all the things that weigh you down, you'll lose every race. But you have a lot of much better chance. I mean, um, when they gave me the award for the charity work that I did at my school, it was a, an honor board. Carol King was on it. Uh, the senator from New York was on it. Um, and it. I'm sitting next to this guy, and um, they, they, they fight him. He looks like a Hasidim. Uh, and this principal tells a story. He says, well, Jacob, first thing when Jacob came to the school, I told all his teachers, leave him alone. If he wants to sit there and read, you just leave him alone. Ignore him. Right? Jacob turned out to be one of the leading experts in space geography. Sitting next to him is me. So the guy says, this is very interesting. It's a surprise. First, it's a surprise that Larry actually graduated. That's the biggest surprise. And the wonderful work he did, that was a bonus. That was not even considered. But I sat next to this guy, and I thought, shit, I'm sitting next to a real genius. And I, I was, that was my honor. I mean, I, to, to, to be in the company of one of the world's uh, leading anything, I mean, but space geography. Anyway, thank you very much. Thanks, Larry.